Welcome to the Road Less Travel with Uriel and Gigi's Boo on RealLibertyMedia.com, RLM Radio. Hello, Gigi's Boo. Hello, Gary. Yeah, and yeah, if you didn't figure it out already, I forgot to start Audacity. I don't know. You know Jim Grimner, right on cue, says practice. You'd think after all these years we'd have that down. But <laughs> as he did point out, a lot of moving parts to get set up and running, and one little distraction can cost a whole bunch. But anyway, we're okay now. I can add in the uh, intro afterwards during post-production. Not a problem with that. So anyway, you were saying how you're doing, Gigi's boo? Fit as a fiddle and that sawing away in an Appalachian holler. That's right. Just fiddling and fiddling and fiddling. And we're not supposed to say this too loudly, but how's Atkins doing? Oh, gosh. Well, he's he's his social self. And he's been outside. Uh, we got to where we propped the door open because he will be laying here sound asleep and he can hear a dog bark outside. And he has to jump up and go see. Bar- he jumps up barking and runs out. And he'll worry you to death wanting in and out. So what we do is we're just leaving the door propped open and he can go in and out. Now, that's not going to work too well when it gets really hot. But he's fine. Um, having a good time doing his things. You know, as I said he would work really well at Walmart because he's a meet and greet fella. And he has a lot of kids that stop by to see him. And he really enjoys that. He likes to get out there early in the morning as they're going to school. And he likes to be there about the time school's out. That's why the door's open because he, he gets kisses through the fence and the whole nine yards. He's the mayor. <laughs> yes. He's the mayor and he's the sheriff and he... It's like it's like Mayberry. <laughs> he does yeah, all of it. He's all. He's he's the whole thing. Yeah, he is. So ain't been up to anything else, Gigi's boo? Except barking in the mirror. He still wants to do that, bark yeah. at himself. I meant you. What about you? Have you been up to anything of interest lately? Oh, I'm always doing interesting things every day, you know that. Yeah, but that's true. Nothing 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 spectacular. Yeah, nothing remarkable. Of course, last week we weren't here. And the reason, storm. yeah, the reason being, and I had this, and it was well predicted that like the day before the timing was there, it was a storm front that moved through here, a very powerful one. In fact, so powerful that a thousand meters from the house, a bunch of fully grown, uh, mature pine trees were snapped in half and there was a trail. So that kind of leads you to suspect that. It was a little tornado that touched down, probably mm-hmm. the a same. A twist. Yeah, probably the same one that touched down up in Lynchburg, not too far away, on mm. Timberlake Road and just tore everything up up there. We were lucky. We literally dodged the bullet but with a little bit of help from a friend of ours, you might say, a, a, a specific little staff that, that I have and somehow learned some of the aspects of use in it. And so, so far, so good with that. Okay, what we got going on here? Yeah, yeah, Grimnir, I, I've noticed that as well. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we started a trend with Kevin McLeod's music. And that's exactly the music that we use, royalty-free music from incompetech.com. That's I-N, competech.com. And you can go in there and just pick up uh, royalty-free music that you know you use for your projects or for your podcasts or whatever you want to use it for. Yeah, thanks, Grimmer, for that reminder, something I often forget to do. I try to put it into the blogcaster, so we give attribution, and that's all he asks for in return. So, Gigi's Boo, a lot, a lot of going on this week, like the last two weeks. In fact, I have so many tabs. If I had dual screens, I might be able to see them all. Mm-hmm. But on our budget, they ain't no dual screens on our budget. <laughs> uh, oh, our yeah. budget. I don't even think qualifies as a budget. No, it doesn't, really doesn't. It's, there is no budget. It's whatever. You know, if you find a penny laying in the road or something, the head's up. And you pick it up and add it to your budget. Anyhow, there's something significant going on. Hal talked about on his show, Behind the Woodshed, which went three and five here on reallibertymedia.com. And it deals with this issue of Natalie Portman. Now, I have to tell you, I, I'm very, I guess you'd say, interested, and actually a little more than interested, because I am proud of Natalie Portman. 
everyone seems to be against those who are oppressing others, and you support the oppressed. In many ways, Natalie Portman is representative of people who have been oppressed by a political movement called Zionism. Natalie Portman was born in Jerusalem, so she has Israeli citizenship, and that's another story <laughs> that we'll touch on as well. But in any case, she does carry Israeli citizenship, as having been born a natural person on the land in Jerusalem. Reality, legally, officially, she is a citizen of Jerusalem, and we'll touch on why that is. Anyway, she stood up and she said that she was going to boycott Israeli business that she was nominated for and awarded this prize, uh, Genesis Prize or something, I believe it is. And she rejected the concept of traveling to Israel in order to receive those accolades because she took exception with some of the behaviors that Israel has been recently guilty of. That's pretty brave. That's a very gutsy move for Natalie Portman, being Jewish by tradition. And uh, that didn't go over so well because <laughs> in Herod's, uh, Natalie Portman's boycott of Netanyahu borders on anti-Semitism. There comes that word. That word which means really nothing. But people have been conditioned to think that it does. It's an ad hominem by definition. And ad hominems are usually thrown out when the other side does not have a strong position to debate from. So when all else fails, and you know that you can't win the argument, you throw ad hominems. And this is what's happened. And amazingly so, here you have someone who is born in Jerusalem, and they're going to say they're going to revoke her citizenship. <laughs> what? It is the most, it's sad, and it's the most ridiculous thing I think I've ever heard. Let's talk about why that is. Semitism, Semitic, relates to a language. It doesn't relate to a genotype. Let's get that right out front. Semitic languages originate in the Middle East. They're spoken by 330 million people across much of Western Asia, North Africa, and the Horn of Africa, as well as large expatriate communities in North America and Europe, with smaller communities in the Caucasus and Central Asia. The term, Semitic, was first used in the 1780s by members of the Gertingen School of History, who derived the name from Shem, one of the three sons of Noah in the book of Genesis. The most widely spoken Semitic languages today are Arabic, Amharic, Tigrinya, Hebrew, Tigray, Aramaic, Assyrian, and Maltese. Ugarithic, Phoenician, Aramaic, Hebrew, Syriac, Arabic, and Southern Arabian alphabets house tied together. So, begin with, the anti-Semitic thing is patently ridiculous on its face, and it, it was it originated, I don't know, it's unbelievable, but let's just leave that where it is. Now, let's talk about Jerusalem for a minute. The term corpus separatum, I think people need to look that up, because long story short, Jerusalem was designated corpus separatum, which means a separated body, by the 1947 United Nations Partition Plan for Palestine. Like it or not whether they had the authority or not, that is the law that all this exists under. According to the plan, Jerusalem will be placed under international regime, conferring it a special status due to a shared religious importance. All the major monotheistic religions are tied to Jerusalem. It was also one of the main issues of the Lausanne Conference of 1949. Besides other borders and the question of the right of return of Palestinian refugees, the plan was adopted by the UN General Assembly with a two-thirds majority, but failed to be implemented on the ground. Well, why was that? Well, you can pretty much figure out why that was, but regardless whether or not it was implemented, it still exists under law as a separate body. In fact, if you remember, some of you might, a year or two ago, there was an issue about passports, whether someone from Jerusalem should officially have an Israeli passport or whether they should have a passport of Jerusalem. The U.S. State Department found, based on the law, that they should properly have a Jerusalem passport. By no means is this settled law. This is might makes right kind of stuff. 
that I don't want to get too deep into that. You can do your own research. There'll be links in the blogcaster. But I do encourage you to understand what's going on with this and how this coercion has been used historically against Western Jews to keep them in line, but originally was designed to slow down and stall the integration of the Western Jews with the rest of Western Europe and other Western countries. And the Zionists, the Eastern Jews, as Douglas Reed pointed out in his seminal work, The Controversy of Zion, that the Eastern Jews, or the Zionists, put the pressure on the Western Jews. And as you can see, being banned or excommunicated, if you will, is a big, big deal with these people. And very much like the Cherokee, is not true, Gigi's boo? Yes, it's true. Talk about the impact of being excluded. Well, when the Cherokee banish you, if you've done something that's terribly bad, it has to be morally and socially bad, but especially within the nation, it's totally, you're banished. You do not have any voting rights. You don't have any rights to see your family. In other words, you don't exist. Now, banishment can be for a lifetime or you can banish for so many months, so many years, so many seasons, so many moons, whatever they decide, but it's a terrible thing. And to be banished from life is terrible. That's uh, never seeing your family again, never being allowed to be around. And I think if people banished more often, you would see less problems. How about you, Gary? I guess what I'm going with that is there are certain cultures, the Cherokee being one of them, and probably has something very much in common with descendants of the Israelites, that banishment is really... Death. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, a, it's tantamount to spiritual death. And, of course, that's a very powerful tool to hold over someone's head, especially when it's unfounded, when you don't have the authority to hold such a tool over someone's head. And re remembering that Zionism is a political thing. It's not a religious thing. They're two entirely different dynamics at work. So mm -hmm. you, try, you try to hide behind a religion and hold it over other people's head. And that's what effectively has been going on for a very long time, bringing me back to the full circle. That's why I'm very impressed with Natalie Portman standing up to that and certainly hope that she doesn't fold. She needs to hang on to that because other people can be inspired by her actions. Anyway, that's all I got on that. I don't want to dig too deep into it because it is an extremely complicated topic. It has a lot of history and a lot of nuances that we don't have enough time to go over here. Anyway, Gigi's Boo, you found something really fun, I think. It's a heartwarming story for me because I've always, with my medical background, I've always been fascinated by what people would call freaks. I call them human oddities, many things. I've always been fascinated with it. I have followed this story before, but I wanted to share it with y'all. It's a story of a romance between the monkey woman and the alligator man, and they were in a sideshow, freak show. They married, and he was, it was Emmett and Priscilla Bajano. They were legends in the carnival world and in the freak show, where they performed as the world's strangest couple. Before they married, they kind of did their own thing and performed by their self. She was known as the monkey girl, and he was known as the alligator skin man. They were human attractions. They were put on display in these freak shows. Now you don't see the freak shows anymore widely in the U.S. except in Atlantic City. Atlantic City on the boardwalk, they have a place for a freak show. Most of the society said that this was a very degrading and detrimental to these people. They will beg to differ with you. They made a living and a good living probably better than any of us ever made. And I know Priscilla, the monkey girl, when people would heckle at her, she would say, guess what? You're paying money to see me. I'm seeing you for nothing. So they had a good sense of humor about them, both of them. They met when they were performing for Johnny J. Jones Exposition in the late 1930s. Priscilla was Priscilla Lauder. She was described as having a beautiful singing voice, and she could really dance, too. When she met Emmett, he was described as kind and gentle, and so their love quickly bloomed, and they eloped in 1938. 
They were just two people with rare skin disorders who truly understood each other and were on the the exact same path of life. They earned their own living. They didn't wait for somebody to give them a handout. When people met them, they said it was obvious that they weren't just in love. They were perfect for each other. Priscilla's parents did not want her to marry. She had been adopted by Carl and Frances Lauder when she was just a toddler, and they were very protective of her. Now, I find that very hard to believe because they let her go into the freak show. I think they were a little upset because she took their livelihood away from them. That's just my personal opinion, because she was the star of their show. And they said that they didn't want her exposed to too many outside influences, such as a husband who might convince her to leave. So you see, there was some underlying reasons there they didn't want her to do. She left the show in 1945, and Emmett did too, and they ended up in Ripley's, believe it or not, traveling exhibition, performing as the strangest married couple in the world. They continued their work through the 50s and 60s. They had positive outlooks and pride in it. Priscilla said, we have fun in our work, and we enjoy what we're doing. And Emmett said, Sideshow work keeps me off the relief line. It's an honest effort, and I feel more or less proud of the fact that I can earn my own money, make my own living, and do anything anybody else can. Nature does funny things in life, but I've lived a normal life. They both ended up working for the king of the sideshows, which was Ward Hall, who had a lot of praise for Priscilla in particular. She had an orange-green complexion, long, beautiful hair all over her face and body. She was a very intelligent, educated lady, and she loved to dance. And I spent many hours dancing with her. She was a great Latin dancer. They wanted to have children, just like any other married couple. But their first experience ended in tragedy. They had a daughter, Francine, who passed away from pneumonia at about four months old. They were heartbroken but they were unwilling to give up, so they adopted a baby boy in 1960. His name was Tony, and they called their little piece of land in Florida the P.E.T. Ranch. That name stood for Priscilla, Emmett, and Tony. Now, he grew up working the carnival circuit with his parent, operating rides and selling concessions. They made enough money on the sideshow circuit that they later broke out into the film, they starred in the movie Carney in 1980 with Gary Buzzy and Jodie Foster, and they made uh, several appearances in documentaries. And I was fortunate enough to see a documentary about them, and they had a little piece of heaven in Florida. Uh, she was still living at the time when they made this documentary, and it was a lovely home, typical open air type Florida home with windows and things, but beautiful trees around it, orange trees, lemon trees, and she said that she loved it. On the documentary, she was asked, did her facial hair bother her husband? And she said, no, didn't bother him at all. They retired and they pulled away from the public eye in the 90s. Her husband, Emmett, passed away in April of 95. They'd been married almost 60 years At that point, Priscilla started shaving her beard and continued to do so for about six years. She made a few more television and documentary appearances. She even appeared on the Jerry Springer show. And I just cannot believe that she lived through that because that's awful. That's an awful show. She talked about her long life as a sideshow attraction and her beloved husband. And she passed away in her sleep on February 5th, 2001 at the age of 90. Priscilla's biological father did not have a clue what his daughter's condition was, and they said they might as well use her unique appearance to make some money in the United States. Her parents had six other children back in Puerto Rico and could have used the extra income. Priscilla was three years old, first time she went on display in the public. Priscilla's father was originally from Spain and spoke mostly Spanish, so he needed a little help with promoting her. And he turned to the professional showman, Carl Lothar, who had years of experience running sideshows. He took interest in her, and he began helping her with her career. And he took care of her when her father shot and killed himself in Gainesville, Florida. 
Priscilla's father's last wish was for Carl Lothar and his wife to adopt Priscilla. Lothar had been her sideshow promoter for a period of time before her father was killed. He and his wife adopted her as their own, and they did care for her, and they did promote her as an attraction. They said they treated her very well. She even said that. But she was very smart. She was fluent in English and Spanish. They hired a tutor to make sure she finished her schooling. And when she told them she was lonely, they gave her a pep chimpanzee. It was very common for sideshow promoters to adopt their human oddities in the early 20th century since the parents often couldn't handle them and give them a better life. Emmett, her husband, was also adopted by his promoter. Her adopted father that promoted her promoted her as the monkey girl. He wasn't a fan of the name and openly defended her when people heckled or called her a freak. And he gave in when he realized the monkey girl name was what drew crowds. She performed with a trained chimpanzee named Josephine. And the two of them had a bit of a balancing act in terms of personalities. And I can just see this. Priscilla was polite and gracious, invited guests to her exhibit, while Josephine would smoke cigarettes and occasionally spit at the guest. I thought that was hilarious. Her biological family had a hard time with her condition, and like I said, they brought her here to the United States, and this is where she became famous. She was born with hypertrichosis, and people years ago were a bit shaken by babies born with this condition. And she was born with a full head of hair, two rows of teeth, and hair all over her body. It's a congenital disease linked to the X chromosome, but can also develop later in life. The symptoms vary from person to person. It can include excessive hair growth, mild abnormalities in the face and teeth, and also deafness. Emmett had a skin condition called ichthyosis. It's a genetic skin disorder characterized by dry, scaling skin that may be thickened or may be very thin. Ichthy is a Greek word for fish. It was this scaly reptilian appearance that led to image stage name, the alligator skin boy. The disease is fairly rare, with 16,000 babies born every year with some form of the condition and 300 born with moderate or severe conditions. There's no known cure for it, but the doctors are developing treatments to ease the symptoms so this person could get some relief because you do suffer for it for the rest of their life. Now, due to his condition, Emmett was unable to sweat properly, so he would spend time in between performance sitting in vats of ice water, now, she said on the documentary that she just thought she had lost it when she didn't think her parents were going to let her stay with Emmett, and they had planned on just running away and maybe staying gone and hiding. And she said that would be very hard for them to do because of both of them's condition. So they decided to kind of stick it out, and they fell in love even more so through the years and died loving each other. I think People have become so politically correct in today's society that they don't see these people as making an honest living. They think the world's making fun of them. And I'm sure that that happened down through the years. People did make fun. People gawked. People looked at them funny. But at least these people had the dignity of making their own life. There was another subject I want to touch on. It's Ronnie and Donnie Galon. You can look them up on Google, any of your search engines. They're conjoined twins, and they are conjoined at the stomach and part of the pelvis. But they have, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I believe four arms and four legs. But they've learned to walk. They built a house they are where they could live and live comfortably. And it's very amazing to listen to them talk because one will start the sentence and the other one will finish it. And it's usually that way if you have twins. Twins are so close that they can read each other's minds. But one question was posed to them. Did they ever feel like they were exploited? And they both laughed and said, do you see what you're sitting in? Beautiful brick home they built for themselves. They do have uh, siblings that do check on them. 
but they're totally in their own world living. They even paid into Social Security. They're old enough now to draw Social Security, but they have a fabulous house. And the house was built for them and their need. Whatever they needed, that's what they did in the house. Now, they were born in 19, I believe it's 1951, and they worked a lot of the sideshows, carnivals, and things of that sort. They posed one question that they always ask conjoined twins. If there's a way to be separated, would you be separated? They said no. They said if one's dying and the other one can be saved by separation, they said no before they could get the sentence out. If one dies, the other one wants to go. That's the way with the two girl conjoined twins at the head, Lori and Dory. They both said that they do not even want them to attempt to separate them. And if it saved one of them's life, if one of them died, they wanted to die together. And I thought it was just remarkable that they loved each other that much, just like the monkey girl and the alligator guy, that they enjoyed their life just the way it was. I have a little quote here I want to use. This came from a tribal sister. Then I'm going to turn it back over to Gary. And this is what it says. Before we came to this earth, we were anxious to have a body of any kind. We understood what a transcendent gift it would be to have a body, even not perfect. Now that we are here, many of us hate and berate our bodies when they deserve and need to be loved respected, and cared for, just as our spirits do. Gary? Yeah, absolutely. And I think listening to what you're saying, I I can see a relationship between the topics that we've gone over thus far. And the relationship to me is, as was pointed out in your, your great stories, thank you, by the way, that what was more important than physicality was what existed beyond that, what what you call it, spiritual or the soul or whatever Mm -hmm. you call it. Something greater existed beyond the physical that influenced the the people that you talked about. And the quote that you read is a very important quote in that way. I want everybody to remember that it doesn't matter what your walk is on this road that we travel. You're here for purpose. I've often wondered why people sometimes had to suffer a lot or you see people who never really make it. They don't ever really get ahead. They try really hard, but they never get ahead. But their life is here for purpose. You're here for a purpose, a God-given purpose. God, whatever you perceive him to be, has a purpose for you. And I'm so much richer knowing people like Ronnie and Donnie and Priscilla and her husband. I would never think for one minute to make fun of anybody like that or really stare. I might stare and ask questions if they gave me the okay. But those people can bring so much into the world. If you just give people a chance, I'm done. Yeah, and and that's exactly right. And it makes me, it reminds me actually how much that physical tool is used against people to divert them, to distract them away from what they really are. (laughs) They're really energetic beings, and we forget about that. In the the case with the Natalie Portman story, that distracts us completely away from the point that we are all energetic beings that flow from exactly the same source. And as Russell Means used to say, we're all related brothers and sisters, and we're all related. And that's why we're all related, because we all flow from the same source. That not that right, Judy Spoo? Yes, you're right. We're all from the same. Yeah. So, you know, how, how difficult it would be to manage everyone if everyone recognized the fact that they were not only manifestations of the same energy being displayed as maybe in some independent manner, but they're also part of a greater energy. And they're all the same. We're all the same. <laughs> no, there, there might be some exceptions. I'm starting to wonder a little bit about some some, some people, maybe whether they're powered from a different source. I'm not sure. But generally speaking, we're all manifestations of the same energy. So people like to make fun of how people look and 
all that good stuff. And you know, that's just fear. People are afraid of what they don't understand. And Atticus agrees with that. Atticus is saying hey to Hal. Oh, he's saying he's howling to Hal. (laughs) (laughs) Well, hi, Atticus. What's up? Anyway, that's enough on that. How about some of the, let's let's lighten it up a little bit. Some of the funniest, most bizarre Craigslist ads ever posted. (laughs) That's why I found this and I thought, well, this might be funny. Let's see. Here's a guy who's... um, in Baltimore, and he's selling his collection of belly button lint. You'll trade for a muscle car, Harley, rifles, gold coins, any kind of work. Also make cash offers. Also interested in motorcycles, and but don't lowball him on his belly button lint. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, that's a good one. How about... Um, Here's a guy that needs a dwarf for a canoe trip at Peace River. I'm not sure where that is. But um, the politically correct term might have been little person if you get into that kind of stuff. But the ad read, looking for a dwarf for a canoe trip this Saturday. It started as a joke between friends about me bringing a dwarf, but I'm wanting to surprise everyone. So you must have a good sense of humor. I'll supply the beer, granted you're 21, and food all day. A group of 30 people are going, and it's a great group. Guaranteed to have a whole lot of fun. I'll even pay you $100 on top of the free beer and food. So if you're looking to have a fun day and full of laughs and beer, send me an email. Okay, let's see. How about healthy mom, healthy baby with milk to spare? Ooh, Gigi's boo. <laughs> In Atlanta, Georgia, price two dollars. I'm a mother of a very healthy nine month old baby boy. He's developing and at an extremely high rate. He's on this seventy five percent for height and fifty percent for weight. I'm producing much more milk than he can handle. I've been certified by a breast milk bank and can email blood work. <laughs> oh jeez, but you're awfully quiet. Uh no, I don't even really uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> I oh, just, man. I'm Let's sorry. Uh, there's other ways Let's to feed your see. child. I just, I know it was done years ago, but mm-mm. yeah. No. Here's one I wanted a mule named Sal. Looking for a mule named Sal to travel to Buffalo on the Erie Canal. Must be a good old worker and a great old pal. Name is non negotiable. <laughs> Not bad, actually. How about a partially eaten coffee cake? Mm, Doesn't list where that is. Probably a good thing. We have a partially eaten coffee cake, free to a good home. After eating the first slice, we decided we no longer wanted the rest of it. You can pick it up, but you must bring your own container because we're keeping our kitchenware. Text for more info or send us an email. Here we go. And this is local. Roanoke. Roanoke, Virginia. My girlfriend does not like my beagle Molly. So I have to rehome her. She's a purebred from a wealthy area, and I have had her four years. She likes to play games. Not totally trained. Has long hair, so she's a little high maintenance, especially the nails, but she loves having them done. Stays up all night yapping, but sleeps while I work. Only eats the best, most expensive food. Will never greet you at the door after a long day or give you unconditional love when you're down. Does not bite, but she can be mean as hell. So, anyone interested in my 30-year-old, selfish, wicked, gold-digging girlfriend, come and get her. Me and my dog want her rehomed ASAP. Oh, God. <laughs> ah, Lord have mercy. Why bring suppressors if they're going to make noise in bushes? I've, I'm lost. I've lost. I'm lost. Uh, I thought she was howling because of the sounds. I, oh, I was Akis. Uh, I don't know. I, frumpy, I'm not... I, I, maybe I'm just old. I can't remember where the suppressors work in. Okay. How about in Flint, Michigan? State of emergency, Gigi's boo. And this is from 2015, but has been updated since then. The Amazon Post, I mean Washington Post, the CIA Daily. In Flint, Michigan, there's so much lead in the children's blood that a state of emergency is declared. They prick the fingers, and it comes back positive. 
lead is very insidious. It leaves a virtually invisible trail. But years later, when young ones <laughs> show signs of learning disabilities or behavioral issues, lead's presence in the bloodstream suddenly becomes inescapable. According to the World Health Organization, lead affects children's brain development, resulting in reduced intelligence or IQ, behavioral changes such as shortening of attention span, and increased antisocial behavior and reduced educational attainment. It can also cause anemia, hypertension, renal impairment, immunotoxicity, and toxicity to the reproductive organs. The neurological and behavioral effects of lead are believed to be irreversible. So... They have a state of emergency. Well, they have a, made a big statement. So uh, let me get this straight. Flint, this is, has to do with the water supply. I feel I feel quite sure. This goes on and on. Talks about petitions with 26,000 st- signatures and whatever that's worth. A politician announcing he had a plan for coming up with $12 million to switch Flint back to the, the Detroit water system. But the real question here, has it happened? Well, I guess not, because they filed a class action lawsuit against the state, the city, and 13 other public officials with the damages they have suffered. The suit, which claims to represent tens of thousands of residents, those similarly situated in the lingo, having deprived them of their 14th Amendment rights by replacing formerly safe, I think they're off on a tangent with that, but it's another story, by replacing their drinking water with a cheap alternative known to be highly toxic. The Detroit Free Press reported back in October then that uh, Flint water had become a way of life for the city residents. And for those who couldn't afford to buy bottled water, for those who could afford, rather, buy it by the gallons. Those who could, couldn't spare the money, drink it straight from the tap all the same, knowing they would be paying for it later. So what kind of mess is this, Gigi's boo? What, how can I some, have no idea. How can something like that go on in what we call a modernized, developed country? I don't get that. Not that, either. That is so bizarre. But in the good news, and the good news, <laughs> in Concordia, I believe that's Argentina or Brazil. I forgot which one. South America. <laughs> Somewhere in South America. August 5th, 2018, they banned glyphosate and other agrotoxics in that city. The city council approved an ordinance that prohibits the use of glyphosate or other chemical herbicides in all green spaces of the city's public lands and establishes fines for the use thereof. Points out that glyphosate is within a group 2A, which means that the agent is probably carcinogenic to humans and those who violate the regulations were liable to receive a fine from the court of misdemeanors equivalent to an amount of 100 and 500 i'm not sure what that word is but i'll have to skip on that anyway this goes through all the the little statute the ordinance that was passed but it's kind of interesting to note that they banned glyphosate in the city but in british columbia in the prince george daily news march 31st 2018 they're actually spraying glyphosate onto the open lands in order to kill what they call the weed trees and promote the growth of uh, the pines. Hmm. Of course, everyone's up in arms about that. They have petitions, again, <laughs> petitions, mother may I type things. They want them to stop spraying the province's forests with herbicide. Currently, between 10,000 and 20,000 hectares of forests are sprayed every year, mostly in the central interior. Since 1980, over 1.3 million hectares have been either sprayed with herbicide glyphosate or manually brushed in the province. And here's their rationale. It wants to promote the growth of conifers like spruce and pine, which are immune to glyphosate, by the way, while killing other broadleaf species like aspen, birch, cottonwood, and willow. And I don't think they talk about the real underlying reason for this. Of course, Monsanto's in the middle of this arguing that it's a good thing, blah, blah, blah. But imagine the uh, wood harvesting, the pine, and the, the building materials and so forth that are harvested and replanted. I would suspect that there's an economic nexus. Anyway, that's fun. It's kind of like Agent Orange in Vietnam. It's just spray glyphosate all over the place. 
Along that same note, you like to eat bread, and this is an old article. It's one to be reminded of. Wheat crops are soaked with glyphosate weed killer before the harvest. And they do that because glyphosate was also classified as a desiccant, which means it dries things out. So after it's cut, they soak it in glyphosate, and then they and then they collect it and uh, then turn it into the wheat and turn it into your bread. Are you eating the cancer bread? And the other thing that that brings up that I feel pretty pretty sure about this whole business about gluten intolerance. I don't think it's anything other than glyphosate intolerance. It's just a dodge to not admit the fact that glyphosate has a very adverse effect on your gut flora. So we come up with something called gluten intolerance to cover that up. But all is not lost. Again, good news. In Switzerland, 5G plans of Swisscom and company had a roadblock thrown in front of them. Strict radiation protection from mobile phone antennas. The Council of States is against a relaxation. So, oh, if you understand how Switzerland works, they're broken up into independent cantons, independent states, and each have their own separate ways of doing things, very much like the the colonies once had under the Articles of Confederation. I guess, for some reason, that concept worked in Switzerland when they claimed it didn't work here. But I digress. That turns out that... They had this vote, and it was a very narrow vote, whether to allow an alteration in the safety rules of the, I guess, the radiation standards associated with these antennas, where 22 counselors voted against it, 21 for it, two abstained. <laughs> two, didn't, two didn't want to take the money, so they abstained. The Council of States stood against the will of the Federal Council. Interesting thing to watch there that you won't see on your mainstream media. Yeah. Anything going on in the chat room, Gigi's boo? Yeah, I don't know, Frumpy. That article was an old one, and I have no reason to, to think that they ever had the water fixed. I have not heard that it had been. Uh, Kate says Flint's supposed to be fine now. No more bottled water being supplied. Well, that's good. I hope that's so, Kate. Uh, that, <laughs> but think about yeah, it. Yeah, me too. I, they had All the time that that was a situation how many people were damaged by it that's pretty sad actually oh let's move along here pretty quickly i wanted to talk about something i think is really important but I may have to use it as a teaser for next week because it is a broad topic and has everything to do with a change in your magnetic field the weakening of the earth's magnetic field which is happening and just as a as an introduction to it, we don't know exactly what that means. We have some pretty good ideas. But the last time we had a complete pole reversal that we know of was about 780,000 years ago, according to the magnetite markers found in certain stone. But science really does not understand exactly how that will affect life on Earth. Some of the indicators are that it might not be pretty, and we're going to talk about that in depth next week because we don't have the time for it tonight. I knew we had two weeks worth of stuff stacked up here. But with that in mind, as we close up here for the evening, here are the top five coffee substitutes when the ship hits the sand and you're, you can't get coffee. Well, there are actually some substitutes from, from backdoor survival, and they're pretty interesting. And some, some of them, people in the South, or one of them anyway, I've heard of, dandelion root. And that's something that dandelion tea, right, Gigi's boo? Yeah. Yeah, they talk about the fact that for centuries, medicinal properties of dandelion tea is a forager's classic. If you roast the roots, however, they can be ground up and used as a healthful substitute for coffee. It's a little bit less bitter than coffee, and it's also less acidic. So that's something... Your dandelions haven't been soaked with glyphosate in the past seven years, and that's how long it takes for the ground to recover. For seven years, then you might be able to give it a try to see what you think. I wonder if you can store that up. You know, it's not like there's a, a limited, <laughs> limited source of it. There haven't been really been any studies into the health effects of dandelion co root coffee. Uh, the plant itself has been found to be extremely healthful with many medicinal properties and beneficial nutrients. As for the coffee drink, it's said to have probiotic effects. So that could be 
a good thing. Chidi's root, what do you think? I think so, yeah. How about chicory root, I think? Chicory's already used widely. In the South, and of course the history of that being that coffee wasn't available during the Civil War, so in the South, part of the embargo stuff, so people went to roasting chicory root anyway, and it's still used. Louisiana is a good example, right, Gigi? Yeah. Louisiana coffee and chicory. That's some strong stuff. Sure. Yep. <laughs> Says it's at a ubiquitous site on many roadsides and highway on-ramps during the summertime. You can pick it out easily by its long, woody, gangly stems and distinctive bluish-purple flowers. As a young plant, it looks similar to dandelion rosette, which is no accident. It's closely related to dandelion and radicchio. How do you say that? Radicchio? Radicchio? And it talks about throwing the chicory flowers into yogurt to liven it up, which can be done. The brew is said to be good for inflammation, liver function, and gut health, as well as having a beneficial effect on blood glucose. Plus, of all the coffee substitutes you can forge, many naturalists agree that chicory coffee comes closest to the real thing, flavor-wise. Well, it is strong, isn't it, Gigi's Boo? Oh, yeah. And just so folks know, there are pictures, actually, in this article. You can, you'll get them in the broadcaster if you're interested. The bad side of it, chicory is easily easy to find on the edges of busy roads, but can be elusive to find in the actual woods. I don't know why that is. That's interesting. In other words, a lot of chicory that you'll encounter will be growing too close to the road to be good for harvesting for risk of consuming byproducts of automobile exhaust and other chemical stuff and so forth. And not to mention the tar that's used in the roads and all that. That's interesting why it wouldn't be found in the wild other than the roads so much. Something called a cleaver seed, which I'd never heard of. Cleaver is also known as sticky willy and goose grass are easy to identify. Once you have what you think is the right plant, see if it sticks to your hands and clothes. These little clingers are covered in minuscule hooks that make them stick to most things they touch, including themselves. And the seeds, coincidentally, can be turned into a hot, pleasing coffee-like beverage as a relative of the coffee plant. Uh It's not too surprising then, is it? Much like traditional coffee, cleavers have diuretic and laxative effects. Uh (laughs) The cleaver plant has been used for centuries as a medicinal herb by native people. Purple avens, water avens, the roots of purple avens can be harvested year-round for a tasty, robust stand-in for coffee. Meaning like to mix in some milk and sugar makes an almost hot chocolatey drink. The leaves are toothed and hairy with numerous leaflets. The buds are droopy, reddish purple, and alien looking with long stalks and spreading clusters. Flowers bloom and into five yellowish petals that form around the purplish centers. Roots are purplish and aromatic. Seeds emerge as part of the feathery, rather, plume or tendril. The name implies this plant, related to roses, loves wet soil. American beech nuts. I think that's the last one. Yeah, American beech nuts. I guess that's from our American beech tree, I suppose. This deciduous 35 to 55 meter tree has bark that is silvery gray and smooth. The leaves have fine teeth in the end of each vein, but the easiest way to identify them is by finding the cigar-like buds. Its smooth bark makes it a favorite tree trunk for young lovers to carve their names into. You never did that, did you, Jesus? Yes, I did. (laughs) The nuts fall to the ground in the fall, at which point you'll be locked in a desperate race against the local squirrels and bird population to get the choice specimens before the deers and the foxes and the bears and the squirrels and other type of creatures steal them all for themselves. Hidden inside those spiky pods are two or three little nuts. Beech nuts also have an outer coating that come off easily after roasting. After getting rid of the husk, just roast the beech nut harvest in a cast iron pan and grind them up. They're rich in fat and protein, making for a hearty brewed drink. So forth and so on. Very good, Gigi's Boo. I think we've run about out of time. We started a little late. Anyway, next week we'll really focus more on this magnetic reversal business because I do think that that is a significant issue. The evidence is there that it is actually weakening at a rate faster than expected. So they're not quite sure what to make of that. And the potential effects of it are pretty drastic. So it's something to keep in mind. Anyway, Gigi's Boo, what you got to say? It's been a pleasure to be here. Remember, I always take the road less travel. And I love you big to my heart. That's right. 
thanks for being here. Appreciate your participation, actually. I got some good stuff coming out of the chat room. Sorry we didn't sorry we didn't get to to a lot of it. But we look forward to seeing you again next week here on the Road Less Traveled. Have a great week. And we'll see ya. Bye bye.